Hello, greedy ghouls, and welcome back to One Spooked Professor. Today, we're going to be taking a look at creepy pastas of all things, as we get to take a look at a, we'll call it a literary movement, going on in our own time. I'm not sure what we're going to label this, but it's certainly one of those technologically driven trends. And history is full of these. The Gutenberg printing press changed a lot about how fiction was spread. You had certain political and religious groups who could influence what types of texts could be spread. There were massive shifts in political temperament that ended up shifting what we were reading or what was the uh, dominant form of literature most valued. And the way these stories traveled and how those cultures functioned all ended up shaping these movements. So I'm going to be looking at creepypastas as an academic would study a new literary subgenre, and it very much is an offshoot of genres that already existed. If you want to get into the etymology of it all, the term creepypasta is derived from a pre-existing term, copypasta, which was used to describe, say, a block of text or something that you would copy and paste and copy and paste and copy and paste and copy and paste. If the nature of the copied content is a creepy story, it's creepy pasta because of copy pasta. Now creepy. Aha. Yes. We're very clever. I mean, I make fun of that, but look at the names we give to animals as part of their taxonomy. Rhinoceros. Nose horn. It sounds like a five-year-old describing the creature. Triceratops, three horns on top, or three-horned face, actually. But enough about terms and names, and back to creepy pasta and how it works. Okay, I lied. There's going to be a little bit of terminology involved. You can take a look at the roots of creepy pastas, dating all the way back to our comprehension of folklore in general. After all, the creepypasta is the descendant of the urban legend, and urban legends are a form of folklore. Folklore can be best understood as a uh, body of stories and other forms of expression that are shared within a particular group of people, culture, or subculture. Uh, this often relates to their traditions, um, and it's often spread orally in like tales, proverbs, or jokes, sometimes even songs, and it can include material culture, ranging from building styles, toys, pictures, and whatever forms of media or mediums they have to work with. Beliefs, rituals, and some forms of coming of age ceremonies often can relate to folklore. And people who have shared that folklore can often relate to each other and go, hey, did you experience this thing? And others go, yeah, yeah. You can tell that generation of American middle and high school kids who got exposed to the internet very early on, back when shock videos were making the rounds and it was largely unregulated. I mean, that's still going on. But if you mention certain video names, people are going to flinch and go, oh yeah, I remember that one. They're going to remember Salad Fingers. They're going to remember Charlie the Unicorn as well. This is not a new phenomenon. If you lived in ancient Rome, in the city of Rome, you would not just be aware of the pop culture of Rome, but you'd be also the recipient of its folklore as well, particularly of the subculture you may be a part of. Folklore is often carried on by what we would call tradition bearers the person telling the story and the audience who would receive it and probably spread it. And during the spreading, it would kind of work like a game of telephone, as people would remember certain details and forget others. Perhaps as times changed, they would also modify the story. Let's say the story was pagan at one point in time, but everyone became Christianized. The story might change appropriately especially the versions that would survive through the years, especially when you consider that a lot of texts survive because of being copied in monasteries throughout uh, the post-classical to Renaissance era, you would see a lot of the Christian versions of older folk tales surviving, while the old pagan roots would be a lot harder to locate, and many of them would be lost forever. 
Hell, even a lot of our notions of Greek and Roman mythology is probably damaged and mismatched because we only have uh, newer versions of them or certain versions became a great deal more popular or were considered the definitive version, thus becoming more influential. Ovidian mythology is probably very different than what he was making fun of or transforming in his perhaps appropriately named Metamorphosis, particularly because at the time he was censured by the Roman Emperor Augustus in no small part because of how he rewrote those myths and his literary style which could be considered somewhat deviant and disrespectful. But we're very familiar with Ovidian Greek and Roman mythology because of Shakespeare and the fact that Ovid's myths survived. Note I'm oversimplifying a lot of how folklore is transferred, but all of this is necessary to know as we jump towards the version of folklore that gave birth to the creepypasta. We refer to these as urban legends, urban myths, urban tales, or contemporary legends. This is a form of folklore that is often circulated as true, or at the very least it could be true, for humor or for horror. Usually the veracity of the story is... uh, very thinly held up with a, oh yeah, I know this one person who knew this person that this happened to, and the details of the story were not necessarily going to be very easy to research or verify. Obviously, some of these stories actually do have their roots in some layer of truth. The hook killer that so dominated a lot of Lover's Lane urban legends is actually loosely, 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 loosely based on Lover's Lane killings. The dude didn't use a hook, though. The Texarkana Phantom Killer of 1946 preferred firearms. And if you know your serial killer history, you know a fair number of serial killers did target lovers alone in their cars in places like that because they were vulnerable. So there's a kernel of truth and was largely a fictitious story but that kernel of truth is what lends to it a believability. And there's often a message attached to these sorts of uh, urban legends, much like the fables of old. Many of these urban legends will be shared orally at schools or at work or during drinking games. And uh, some of these will be ritualistic in nature. The Bloody Mary game is basically a gamified ritual designed to test bravery. I mean, hey, it sounds a a lot less of a (laughs) of a scary test compared to, hey, let's let bullet ants sting you so you can prove your masculinity. Uh, The Bloody Mary test sounds a lot mm, less terrifying. The term urban legend has been around in print from at least the late 60s, but really achieved popularity with Jan Harold Brunvund, a professor who worked at the University of Utah who studied folklore and legends in general. And he did so as part of his claim that the process of legend creation and folklore did not die out with older societies. We've continued the process, and I would argue we've actually accelerated it. These types of legends will often mold with our current fears of the time, teach lessons that we consider valuable in a given cultural context, but they're nominal roles and meanings have remained largely the same. They often propagate the same ways and they represent some form of shared belief in communication. Uh, They would sometimes relate to the popular or religious mythology in some way, shape, or form. And uh, they come in many different genres. There are crime urban legends, medical mystery urban legends, paranormal urban legends, particularly like the cryptids are a, a famous one. And the internet opened up a new medium for this stuff to appear, which is where we get the origins of the creepypasta. The creepypasta is a clear descendant of the stories told around campfires or to scare people at slumber parties and also works of literature descended from the gothic movement and even things like the cosmic horror genre i mean lovecraft has left a pretty big impression on this movement 
And like the evolution of other literary genres, it didn't come out in its fully formed shape. It slowly grew ad hoc style into what we recognize as a creepypasta with an emergence period, a formalization period, a parody period, and where we are now. While a firm beginning for creepypastas is virtually impossible to claim for sure, it seems to be a consensus that chain emails were the start of this new form of urban legend, as many of these old urban legends would be digitized, written into uh, emails and sent to others with some sort of repost this or a ghost will visit you or something like that, much like other uh, you know, chain email things that were very common in the old days of the rise of the internet and how they're still common now. The fact that these things are often published anonymously and are reposted so many times and are often presented as something real rather than as an accredited work of fiction makes tracking their origins rather difficult. Sometimes we've been able to piece it together, but most of the times not so much. And here we see one of the earliest parts of the genre coming together. Like urban legends, there is a lack of a disclaimer stating who the author is and that this is a work of fiction directly blurring the lines of reality and fantasy. It will often use real place names, or at least ones that could be real. Character names from the real world, and sometimes even actual website names get used, and this can be a part of that illusion. Creepypasta writers do as much world building as they do hybridization of their fictitious world with the real world, which is something you often see in well-executed urban legends. And you can see this cloaking of stories without the disclaimer and sometimes a false attributing to a figure that doesn't exist or may have existed but no one has any way of knowing as a clear descendant tradition from the Gothic. Remember, if any of you listened to my Gothic uh, episode, that this was something that was used in a lot of the early uh, gothic romances and gothic horror stories. Horace Walpole, who wrote the story The Castle of Otranto, and disguised the authorship with a fictitious translator and a whole little backstory that isn't based in reality for the origins of the work. Yeah, some of that stuff that you read in literature classes it's coming back around and shaping your creepy pastas. There is indeed a loose, long, causal relationship between high fiction writers and the great artistes the professors wax on whimsically about and the mess that is Jeff the Killer. That terrible story comes later in our narrative, though. The same sort of amorphous reality and potential unreality of the stories gave them an eerie edge, much in the same way the plausibility of the verbal urban legends, leaving just enough room for someone to believe in them to make them eerie, but also enough room for someone to dismiss them as needed. One of the earliest creepypastas to receive widespread recognition is Ted the Caver, a story that is rooted in some rather realistic caving techniques, though its more supernatural elements are quite a bit divorced from its more realistic grounding. But it's that grounding that allows people to suspend their disbelief. And also its environment being one that not everyone has explored that makes it mysterious and in many ways claustrophobic and uncomfortable. I mean, read that story and you tell me you don't feel just the least bit squished. I believe Ted the Caver came out in the early 2000s, uh, as I look it up here, 2001, and it is recognizable as creepypasta in form. So the genre has already somewhat coalesced and codified here, as it appears in the form of a series of blog posts as the characters move further into the cave. From the last post, it also serves 
as an apocalyptic log. The first person perspective of this angel fire post also is something that gets carried forward in a lot of creepypastas. In no small part because first person allows people to experience the horror and the unknown more intimately and it's a lot more limited, allowing us to maintain some mystery. Something that has survived in the majority of creepypastas. So much so, it is almost like a cornerstone of the genre itself. These stories that grew in emails and in internet forums would eventually receive forums of their very own. Places where these stories would be collected and shared in mass. Places like 4chan would become a hotspots for this and would greatly aid in the genre's development. Many of these creepypastas would come in several different forms. Some would involve rituals and games, much like the Bloody Mary games of old. They would come in the form of personal stories, diary entries, and uh, other things like, uh, oh, travel blogs dating kind of back to those adventure pulps. Some of these would actually revive older urban legend figures and give them a new cyber lease on life, where others would introduce either amorphous entities that would appear only once or twice, or even creepypasta icons who would very much become the face of the genre itself. The most important of these we'll talk about later. You've got things like uh, creepypasta.com r slash no sleep and the creepypasta wiki and all sorts of places giving these things a permanent home. This sense of solid groundwork, this ability to have the stories in a permanent archive in a print solid form that doesn't really change past its initial publication changed the very nature of these urban legends. They no longer functioned like a game of telephone, but they still existed within a idea marketplace where there was no clear financial ownership over a lot of these ideas. Thus, a creature that appears in one story could be modified in another. These became communally shared and developed mythologies. And these stories developed their own trends and bucked those old trends in real time. If you're someone who studies folklore or literature, you should definitely look at how the trends have risen and fallen within creepypasta stories. It's a good time. And the speed at which this can occur is a part of both the decentralization, the lack of gatekeeping, and hyperconnectivity that has largely defined the underbelly and mainstream culture of the early internet, something that in some form still survives today, though the decentralized lack of gatekeeping has certainly received a lot of corporate and national challenges of late. This environment still shaped the creepypasta. And we get treated to a weird combination of, hey, what if the Cthulhu mythos really had no rules and it's just the Wild West out here and anyone can use any of these ideas? Well, that's where some of these icons of the creepypasta genre ended up coming from. Slenderman, probably the most famous creepypasta icon, is the result of this nebulous community. And in many ways, the amorphous and ad hoc nature of the creature's origin really fits with his nature as a character. In this case, form, as much as content, is what led to the development of Slenderman. Now, Slenderman himself first appears in the Something Awful Internet Forum as a part of a Photoshop contest where they were supposed to create creepy paranormal images. A creator, and I'm going to try and say these names right, by the name of Eric Knudsen, working under the pseudonym Victor Surge, ended up producing two black and white images of children. And in the background, he added a tall, thin, spectral figure wearing a suit. And while the contest was really only about the photographs, he actually added little blurbs of text to go with them. Underneath the first one, he wrote, 
We didn't want to go. We didn't want to kill them. But its persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time. The one under the second read as follows. One of the two recovered photographs from the Sterling City Library blaze, notable for being taken the day which 14 children vanished, and for what is referred to as the Slender Man. Deformities cited as film defects by officials. Fire at library occurred one week later. Actual photograph confiscated as evidence. These blurbs and pictures tell a story through a combination of the two different mediums. As uh, far as I've heard, Nudson was somewhat inspired uh, by uh, The Insidious Beast, by Stephen King's The Mist, Shadow People, Mothman, I think the Mad Gaster of Mattoon, and other things like the Tall Men, and uh, even figures from popular video games. But he left it something vague general and mysterious and as we've mentioned before on this podcast mystery is the progenitor of a lot of good horror it also ties into archetypical creatures that already exist a lot in our fiction uh, take the fae ghosts and things like uh, eldritch abominations not to mention the the kind of suit-like appearance that has already been tied to things like the men in black uh, secret government agencies and all sorts of other things. Heck, I'm reminded of XCOM, for goodness sake. Well, the internet ate it up and began to spit out more content, completely unrelated to the original creator of the images. This would come in the form of art, other forms of fiction, and even cosplays. But uh, the creepy pastas are really where this character spread out. Many of these stories had little to nothing in common with each other. How he functioned or what motivated him in one story, if such things were even made clear, did not necessarily carry over to the next. The very amorphous nature of these rules allowed him to re retain his mystery despite being such a well-publicized and well-documented creature. This would eventually evolve into small-scale video series and indie games, which would carry the character to whole new heights. You can thank Let's Players for that, who brought these indie games into the mainstream and yet also derived a great deal of attention because of their reactions to these games. Enter a symbiotic relationship between all these new indie games and the Let's Players. Similarly, there is a growing community of people who would read these creepy pastas and achieve notoriety from this. This multimedia interconnectivity links creepy pastas to other forms of internet culture, bringing it more into that cyber shared space that is truly different from what came before. And whole new generations of indie games, many of which were terrible, and creepypastas ended up joining the ranks of older works like the Russian Sleep Experiment. Indeed, uh, many of the formative works of the genre, like said Sleep Experiment, Ted the Caver, and uh, Squidward Suicide, would form the foundations for the subgenres within creepypasta that are recognizable to most people who read within those works. And my goodness, are there many of them that are recognizable, some of which I think I'd love to get into on their own. But uh, I'll talk about a few of them here. Uh, one of the most common that I remember when I was first getting into it are the lost episode creepypastas. There's some episode or film that was removed from mainstream presentation and this character through some means perhaps normal or supernatural sees the video and is horrified by it it often involves the death destruction or otherwise horrific inversion of a beloved character or characters there are video game creepypastas in no small part because video games are a relatively new outlet for storytelling and a lot of people writing creepypastas were involved in those communities and I saw them as ripe uh, places to 
grow their tails and hide their new monsters. There are killer creepypastas, killers usually teenager, who has some sort of downfall story that makes them a psychopath, and they often have a uh, trademark disfigurement. You have your rules stories where your ha character has taken a new job or lives in a new place and they have rules they're supposed to follow, and if they don't follow them, something bad happens. These are very much the uh, clear descendant of fables. My girlfriend is actually very fond of the abandoned amusement park subgenre, though abandoned places in general have often served as fodder for... Uh, horror stories, and creepypastas are no exception to this, with people entering an abandoned area and discovering why it was abandoned being a common model for this type of tale. Then, of course, there are the ritual-slash-gamified sorts of stories, where it's all about how to do this ritual or what a person goes through in order to survive it. Uh, last of all would be the supernatural monster genre, which draws as much from Lovecraft as it does from older gothic tales. Going back to Slender Man now, since we just recently brought up Eldritch Abominations, after the codification of the character in Slender the Eight Pages, there began to be more active efforts to come up with a solid canon for the character, which in many ways clashed with the fact that he evolved without a canon and his, his uh, motives became a lot more codified in the mainstream compared to when he was largely mysterious. Still, there is a large subculture that remains attracted to him for many of the reasons that uh, people likely were in the first place. His collaborative nature, his uh, ability to serve as a source for creating new stories, and the sense of authenticity of a legend that in so much film and photograph and even in the stories blurs the line between reality and fiction. There are also archetypical facets of his physical depiction that horrify us on a level that is akin to monsters of old. His featureless face, his uncanny valley look, the stretched wrong appearance, the suit-like symbol of authority, all of these are, are going to mess with people on some level, or at the very least create some response if you are aware of their cultural significance, in some cases on an instinctive level. If the canonization of a core set of stories for Slender Man somewhat hampered the popularity of the character, what really kind of shook it up was the Wakisha stabbing, where two 12-year-old girls in Wakisha, Wisconsin, uh, stabbed one of their classmates 19 times. When asked why they did it, they claimed that they were, well, doing it because Slenderman told them so. Now, do I believe that these stories caused these two crazy ass hats to do it? No. If it hadn't been Slenderman, it would have been something else. But still, that sort of moral panic that comes from something like this can really shake up a community, and despite attempts uh, by the creepy pasta community to help the victims of this tragedy and shield the community, it still left its mark on both the character and really the uh, creepypasta community as a whole. The poor film of Slenderman probably did not help the character much at all. Slenderman's emergence from two photographs from almost nothing was amazing. He it played a huge role in an entire culture bringing some meaning and fear to many people's t tales. And then he grew increasingly popular, commodified, and uh, eventually experienced a downfall of sorts, as often happens with many important symbols. So in a way, creepypastas are very much like many other literary and cultural movements. And uh, there are many other stories and figures that have really shifted the nature of creepypastas as well. Jeff the Killer certainly brought a new audience, though one that is debatably wanted. Jeff the Killer is, well, it's a tale of a teenager named Jeff who is bullied and then has glorious revenge against the bullies, goes crazy and starts killing people in some weird, terribly written power fantasy.
I'm serious. And whenever my girlfriend wants to hurt me, she'll either read this aloud or my immortal. Like many other popular creepypasta figures, he got his own spin-offs, copycats, and a lot of fan art, much of which had OCs romancing him. Like the Joker, he has received more than his fair share of hybristophilic intentions. Some that borderline on Draco in leather pants. There are a few that aren't even borderline. Sonic X and innumerable Pokemon stories also changed the uh, sphere of gaming creepypasta stories, so much so that uh, I'm not sure the Wikipedia has been able to keep up with all of them. And unless I'm wrong, and if I am, correct me, they don't even house them anymore. The anonymous nature of these stories have also changed as authorship and intellectual rights to these characters and stories have become a principal matter of concern. This is something quite a bit different from the much more vague urban legends, with creepypastas becoming kind of a catch-all term for horror stories told online. So you can kind of see those stages as I described them earlier, that multiple literary uh, movements and medium industries like the comics industry have experienced. You have the initial forays into new things that create the genre. You have the famous figures who make the genre successful and create sort of the canon works of that uh, genre or movement. Then you have its imitation continuation and evolution, then you sort of have that pitch point where it's oversaturated that leads into the parody slash downfall period. Then you have the reconstruction and evolution period. And I would argue that we're in that reconstruction period right now, as there is a sort of increased search for relevancy again among the creepypasta community as it seeks to leave behind some of its uh, more scandalous past, like Jeff the Killer and uh, the Wikisha stabbings, and still forge ahead with creating new content. Some of it's still satirical, but there are still a lot of attempts to create good horror fiction. I would still say most of them don't succeed. I have to hunt and hunt and hunt to still find a good one, but sometimes there is a satisfying horror story to be had. And as someone who grew up on horror stories, they're a nice place of calm for me until I have to sleep and then I'm in real trouble. The four functions of folklore, according to William Bascom, still remain a core element of creepypasta. It lets people escape from the repressions of society or the controls of society. It lets us talk about things that we're not supposed to talk about in front of others. It can often validate your in-group or culture. You justify your rituals and your institutions and your rules while attacking those rules and values that you don't like. So it serves as, the third point, a reinforcement for morals and values while at the same time becoming a way to apply a sort of narrative social pressure on behalf of your own. It still remains a multimedia sort of, uh, I would say, maybe industry, genre, we'll just say art form. Creepypastas as something read to you, mixing multimedia with text, being the basis for movies and television shows and even machinima series, or still being something posted on lonely forums. They can take a variety of different forms that can interconnect. Even the blurbs for pictures that gave birth to Slenderman are still a thing within the genre. Creepypasta is also a modern inheritor of many other literary and artistic styles and movements. It has clearly inherited a lot of the gothic uh, artistic and storytelling tropes, but it also pulls in surrealistic modernist and postmodernist tropes as well there is that tendency to transform something that is wholesome and nostalgic into something horrifying and perverse, usually twisting, you know, children's television shows, amusement parks, things like that, into something that they should not be. The fear of the unknown is, of course, always there and certainly present. 
there is this tendency to upend the old while focusing on the old. Again, something uh, from the Gothic movement. All of these things are a part of the still-evolving creepypasta genre. To all of those who listen to and write creepypastas, you're a part of a living art form and are participating in its evolution. You are getting to witness it. In many cases, you're shaping it and partaking in it. So uh, if you want to have some idea what it was like to be in the romance literary period, being a reader of these new works and seeing how they clash with other art forms and how they're received by the powers that be and the masses, well, you've got some idea of that right now. We're still telling legends, whether they come in the form of urban myths or creepypastas. These legends, these stories, they still mean something to us. There's something that is present in every society, every culture, that virtually every human can relate to on some level that is live in these stories. Try to soothe yourself with that the next time you come across a creepypasta that's so bad you can't imagine why it was written. Because eventually, if you keep trying, you'll come across those good ones that remind you, this is why I listen. Or read them, depending on how you prefer to take them in. I, I like the YouTube audios myself. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little discussion, and I hope you all have a wonderful, preferably slightly creepy day. Take care. Or as the once-fooked professor, I should probably say, class dismissed.